Welcome to the Appendix, where we read the primary sources of the past so that the present can be better understood. Today's primary source, Declaration of the Causes and Necessity of Taking Up Arms, July 6, 1775. Franklin, J. Rutledge, Livingston, Johnson, Jefferson, and Dickinson were the members of the committee appointed to draw up this declaration. The final draft is the work of Dickinson and Jefferson. If it were possible for men who exercise their reason to believe that the divine author of our existence intended a part of the human race to hold an absolute propriety in and on unabounded power over others, marked out by his infinite goodness and wisdom as the objects of a legal domination never rightfully resistible, however severe and oppressive the inhabitants of these colonies might at least require from the Parliament of Great Britain some evidence that this dreadful authority over them has been granted to that body. But a reverence for our great Creator, principles of humanity, and the dictates of common sense must convince all those who reflect upon the subject that government was instituted to promote the welfare of mankind and ought to be administered for the attainment of that end. The legislature of Great Britain, however, stimulated by an inordinate passion for a power not only unjustifiable, but which they know to be particularly retrobated by the very constitution of that kingdom, and desperate of success in any mode of contest, where regarded should be had to truth, law, or right, have at length, deserting those attempting to effect their cruel and impolitic purpose of enslaving these colonies by violence, and have thereby rendered it necessary for us to close with their last appeal from reason to arms. Yet, however blinded that assembly may be by their intemperate rage for unlimited domination, so to slight justice and the opinion of mankind, we esteem ourselves bound by obligations of respect to the rest of the world to make known the justice of our cause. Our forebears, inhabitants of the island of Great Britain, left their native land to seek on the shores a residence for civil and religious freedom, at the expense of their blood, at the hazard of their fortune, without the least charge to the country from which they removed, by unceasing labor and an unconquerable spirit. They effected settlements in the distant and inhospitable wilds of America, then filled with numerous and warlike nations of barbarians, societies or governments vested with perfect legislatures who were formed under charters from the crown and in harmonious intercourse with establishment between the colonies and the kingdom from which they derived their origin. The mutual benefits of this union became in a short time so extraordinary as to excite astonishment. It is universally confessed that the amazing increase of the wealth, strength, and navigation of the realm arose from this source, and the minister, who so wisely successfully directed the measures of Great Britain in the late war, publicly declared that these colonies enabled her to triumph over her enemies. Towards the conclusion of the war, it pleased the sovereign to make a change in his counsels. From that fatal moment, the affairs of the British Empire began to fall into confusion, and gradually sliding from the summit of glorious prosperity to which they had been advanced by the virtues and abilities of one man, are at length distracted by the convulsions that now shake it to its deepest foundations. The new ministry, finding the brave foes of Britain, though frequently defeated, yet still contending, took up the unfortunate idea of granting them a hasty peace, and of then subduing her faithful 
France. These devoted colonies were judged to be in such a state as to present victories without bloodshed and all the easy emoluments of statuable blunder. The uninterrupted tenor of their peaceable and respectful behavior from the beginning of colonization, their dutiful, zealous, and useful services during the war, though so recently and amply acknowledged in the most honorable manner by His Majesty, by the late King, and by Parliament, could not save them from the mediated innovations. Parliament was influenced to adopt the pernicious project, and assuming a new power over them, have in course of eleven years given such decisive specimens of the spirit and consequences attending this power as to leave no doubt concerning the effects acquiescence under it. They have undertaken to give and grant our money without our consent, though we have ever exercised an exclusive right to depose of our own property. Statutes have been passed for extending their jurisdiction of courts of admiralty and vice-admiralty beyond their ancient limits, for depriving us of the custom and inestimable privilege of trial by jury in cases affecting both life and property, for suspending the legislature of one of the colonies, for interdicting all commerce to the capital of another, and for altering fundamentally the form of government established by charter and secured by acts of its own legislature, solemnly confirmed by the crown for exempting these murderers of colonists from legal trial and, in effect, from punishment for erecting in a neighboring province acquired by the joint arms of Great Britain and America a despotism dangerous to our very existence and for quartering soldiers upon the colonists in time of profound peace. It has also been resolved in Parliament that colonists charged with committing certain offenses shall be transported to England to be tried. But why should we enumerate our injuries in detail? By one statute it is declared that Parliament can of right make laws to bind us in all cases whatsoever. What is to be defended us against so enormous, so unlimited a power? Not a single man of those who assume it is chosen by us or is subject to our control or influence. But, on the contrary, they are all of them exempt from the operation of such laws and an American revenue is not diverted from the ostensible purposes for which it is raised, would actually lighten their own burdens in proportion as they increase ours. We saw the misery to which such despotism would reduce us. We for ten years incessantly and ineffectively besieged the throne as supplicants. We reasoned we remonstrated with Parliament in the most mild and decent language, but administration sensible that we should regard these oppressive measures as freemen ought to do, sent our fleets and armies to enforce them. The indignation of the Americans was roused, it is true, but it was the indignation of a virtuous, loyal, and affectionate people. A Congress of delegates from the United Colonies was assembled at Philadelphia on the fifth day of last September. We resolved again to offer a humble and dutiful petition to the King and also addressed our fellow subjects of Great Britain. We have pursued every temperate, every respectful measure. We have even proceeded to break off our commercial intercourse with our fellow subjects as the last peaceable admonition that our attachment to no nation upon earth should supplant our attachment to liberty. This we have flattered ourselves with the ultimate step of the controversy, but subsequent events have shown how vain was this hope of finding moderation 
and our enemies. Several threatening expressions against the colonies were inserted in His Majesty's speech. Our petition, though we were told it was a decent one, and that His Majesty had been pleased to receive it graciously, and to promise laying it before his Parliament, was huddled into both houses among a bundle of American papers, and there neglected. The Lords and Commons in their address in the months of February said that a rebellion at that time actually existed within the province of Massachusetts Bay, and that those concerned in it had been countenanced and encouraged by unlawful combinations and engagements entered into by His Majesty's subjects in several of the other colonies, and therefore they besought His Majesty that he would take the most effectual measures to enforce due obedience to the laws and authorities of the Supreme Legislature. Soon after, the commercial intercourse of whole colonies with foreign countries and with each other was cut off by an act of Parliament. By another, several of them were entirely prohibited from the fisheries in the seas near their coasts, on which they always depended for their sustenance, and large reinforcements of ships and troops were immediately sent over to General Gage. Fruitless were all the entries, arguments, and eloquence of the illustrious band of the most distinguished peers and commoners who nobly and strenuously asserted the justice of our cause, to stay or even to mitigate the heedless fury with which these accumulated and unexampled outrages were hurried on. General Gage, who in the course of the last year had taken possession of the town of Boston in the province of Massachusetts Bay, on the ninth day of April, sent out from that place a large detachment of his army, who made an unprovoked assault on the inhabitants of the said province at the town of Lexington, as appears by the affidavits of a great number of persons, some of whom were officers and soldiers of that detachment, murdered eight of the inhabitants and wounded many others. From thence the troops proceeded in warlike array to the town of Concord, where they set up another party of the inhabitants of the same province, killing several and wounding more, until compelled to retreat by the country people suddenly assembled to repel this cruel aggression. Hostilities thus commenced by the British troops have been since prosecuted by them without regard to faith or reputation. The inhabitants of Boston, being confined within that town by the general their governor, and having in order to procure their administration, entered into a treaty with him. It is stipulated that the said inhabitants, having deposed their army with their own magistrates, should have liberty to depart, taking with them their other effects. They accordingly delivered up their arms, but in open violation of honor, in defiance of the obligation of treaties, which even savage nations esteemed sacred. The governor ordered the arms deposited as aforesaid that they might be preserved for their owners, to be seized by a body of soldiers, detained the greatest part of the inhabitants in the town, and compelled the few who were permitted to retire to leave their most valuable effects behind. The general, further emulating his ministerial matters by a proclamation bearing date on the twelfth day of June, venting the grossest falsehoods and calamities against the good people of these colonies, proceeds to, quote, declare them all, either by name or description, to be rebels and traitors, to supersede the course of the common law, and instead thereof to publish and order the use and exercise of the law martial, unquote. His troops have butchered our countrymen, have wantonly burnt Charlestown, besides a considerable number of houses in other places, our ships and vessels are seized. The necessary supplies of provision are intercepted, and he is exerting his utmost power to spread destruction and devastation around him. 
We have received certain intelligence that General Charlton, the governor of Canada, is instigating the people of that province and the Indians to fall upon us, and we have but too much reason to apprehend that schemes have been formed to excite domestic enemies against us. In brief, a part of these colonies now feel, and all of them are sure of feeling as far as the vengeance of administration can inflict them, the complicated calamities of fire, sword, and famine. We are reduced to the alternatives of cussing, of cussing and unconditional submission to the tyranny of irritated ministers or resistance by force. The latter is our choice. We have counted the cost of this contest and find nothing so dreadful as voluntary slavery. Honor, justice, and humanity forbid us tamely to surrender that freedom which we received from our gallant ancestors and which our innocent posterity have a right to receive from us. We cannot endure the infamy and guilt of resigning seceding generations to that wretchedness inevitably waits them if we basely entail heredity bondage upon them. Our cause is just. Our union is perfect. Our internal resources are great. And if necessary, foreign assistance is undoubtedly attainable. We gratefully acknowledge as signals instances of the divine favor towards us that this providence would not permit us to be called into this severe controversy until we had grown up to our present strength, had been previously exercised in warlike operations, and possessed of the means of defending ourselves. With hearts fortified, with these animating reflections, we most solemnly before God and the world declare that, exerting the utmost energy of those powers which our beneficent Creator has graciously bestowed upon us, the arms we have been compelled by our enemies to assume we will, in defiance of every hazard, with unabating firmness and perseverance employ for the preservation of our liberties, being with one mind resolved to die freemen rather than to live slaves. Least this declaration should disquiet the minds of our friends and fellow subjects in any part of the empire, we assure them that we mean not to dissolve that union which has so long and so happily subsisted between us and which we sincerely wish to see restored. Necessity has not yet driven us into that desperate measure or induced us to excite any other nation to war against them. We have not raised armies with ambitious designs of separating from Great Britain and establishing independent states. We fight not for glory or for conquest. We exhibit to mankind the remarkable spectacle of a people attacked by unprovoked enemies without any imputation or even suspicion of offense. They boast of their privileges and civilization, and yet proffer no milder conditions than servitude or death. In our own native land, in defense of the freedom that is our birthright, and which we ever enjoy till the late violation of it for the protection of our property, acquired solely by the honest industry of our forefathers and ourselves, against violence actually offered, we have taken up arms. We shall lay them down when hostilities shall cease on the part of the aggressors, and all danger of their being renewed shall be removed, and not before. With a humble confidence in the mercies of the supreme and impartial judge and ruler of the universe, we must devoutly implore his divine goodness to protect us happily through this great conflict, to dispose our adversaries to reconciliation on reasonable terms, 
and thereby to relieve the empire from the calamities of civil war. By order of Congress, John Hancock, President. Thank you for joining us for our primary source today on the appendix. We will see you in the stacks.